So thanks, Alan, uh, very much for that introduction. And I'd just like to thank Alan um, and Matt for Matt Wakefield and Alan Rubin for organizing this mini conf. And thanks to everyone for coming along. So I'm going to talk about clinical genomics from a computational perspective. Um, so a couple of slides about biology. Apologies if you are already familiar with this stuff. Um, I suspect that we'll see a few of these slides repeatedly through the talks today. That's fine. A bit of repetition is good for memory. Um, and you can also play bioinformatics bingo, if you like, um, as we go along. So the thing I'm talking about is genomics and clinical genomics. So it should be um, important to introduce those ideas. So what is genomics? Um, in general, it's the study of the structure and function of DNA in a holistic manner. Um, so you've heard probably about genetics um, before, and it's similar. Um, genomics just takes the idea really from studying DNA and genetics, which looks really focused on genes, um, and considers larger collections of DNA, which might be multiple genes. It might be the entire set of DNA. Um, it might be subparts. But the idea is to, to see the um, function of cells um, being um, a collection of many different things um, working together. And so we have this kind of holistic view. Um, clinical genomics is really um, the diagnosis and treatment of medical conditions with reference to a patient's DNA. So it's basically the application of genomics in a hospital setting. Um, previously, and up, really up until recently, the genomics has been the, the remit of research programs, and so it's mostly been people figuring out how can we actually understand genomes, um, how can we actually um, work out what's going on in cells, but it's gotten to the point now that we can actually apply it in um, hospitals for medical treatment. So um, again, apologies if you already uh, are familiar with this, but um, I thought I'd just go over some basic biology to begin with. So in this diagram here, we've got a picture of a cell, sort of a cartoon version of what a cell might be like. Um, inside the cell, in the center part, you've got a collection of chromosomes. It's labeled as nucleus there. Um, and a single chromosome is expanded out. And you can see that that chromosome is really this tightly coiled sequence of DNA. It's a very, very long molecule, all t tied up, um, very tight bundle. Um, packed together rather ingeniously inside the nucleus. Uh, and if you look at the DNA closely, you can see it's a double-stranded molecule, um, and it's made up of um, a genetic code of four symbols that, well, computer science people tend to think of them as symbols. They're really um, uh, chemicals, but we're um, just thinking comp computationally. Um, so there's A, T, G, and C are the symbols which correspond to um, these nucleotides that make up these molecules, and they, they pair up together. Um, that's all you really need to know from the biological perspective for my talk. Um, the key thing is that um, we have this thing called the central dogma of biology, which is a very crude approximation to what's going on, but it's a good enough narrative to um, understand the basic processes behind genomics. So at the top there, we have um, a DNA molecule which is double-stranded. Um, and DNA is um, interesting for a couple of reasons. One is it can be copied. Um, and basically, each of, the two, each of the two strands in the double-stranded molecule can uh, themselves um, go off to form another pair. Um, and you can keep copying. So that's how replication happens. And it's how genetic information is passed on through generations of cells. Um, but also, DNA can be um, transcribed. Um, into a molecule called RNA, which is very, very similar. Um, it, RNA is typically a single strand in its, um, when it's inside the, the cell. Um, and RNA basically contains the same information as the DNA, um, but the RNA in this case acts like a message, which is passed from the nucleus of the cell into the external part called the cytoplasm. And then at the last, at the bottom part of that diagram there, you see that the RNA can be translated into um, proteins. So essentially what you have on the DNA molecule is a code um, made up of those letters A, T, G, and C. 
that's copied as it is, transcribed directly into RNA, so it keeps the AET, G, and C as they are, um, and then um, that's then turned into a protein by something called the ribosome, um, and the proteins are the workhorse molecules of life, um, and in humans there's roughly, I think if I remember correctly, around 100,000 or so different proteins um, making up all different things inside your body. And so, um, so the point is that DNA contains a code that can um, be turned into proteins, and the proteins are um, one of the most significant um, molecules in life and build most of the things that in our bodies. Um, there's, there's much more to it than that, um, and practically everything you hear about biology is wrong in some way or, uh, or other, um, but that's okay. It's, um, it's sufficient to understand this process in this way because that's what we're interested in from the point of view of genomics at the moment. So there's kind of two key ideas to understand from genomics um, and how they affect um, organisms. So we call the genotype um, basically the DNA contained in the cell, but really interpreted as a biological code because, of course, DNA is really just a, a molecule. Um, but when you think of genotype, you think of the code that it carries. Um, and um, each cell in the, the human body has the same genotype, more or less. Um, uh, it's good, good to a first approximation. Um, so despite all of the cells in your body having, well, different cells can have different functions because they might exist in different organs. Neurons, for example, behave different than skin cells. Yet in the nucleus of skin cells and in the nucleus of neurons, they have the same um, DNA. So they have the same genotype, but somehow cells are able to distinguish themselves and figure out um, that they should behave in a certain way. Um, so it's not just the um, DNA code um, that's significant. There's other things that determine the fate of a cell. So we also talk about phenotype, which is really the um, phenomenon. So it's the observable traits of an organism, such as its shape, color, size, its behavior, um, the phenotype can describe a lot of different things, but you can think of phenotype as what you observe if you look at an organism. And phenotype is typically the way um, people are treated when they present to a hospital um, in the medical process. So they, they go and see a doctor, the doctor looks at them, um, and they may conduct some tests, um, observations of the patient. They're really trying to ascertain the phenotype of the individual. And then doctors have this um, mapping from phenotypes to treatments in their brain, um, and they apply that mapping if they can figure out what the phenotype is. Um, but there's more to the story than just genotype um, uh, determining a phenotype. You, we have this equation which is genotype plus environment gives rise to a phenotype. So um, as I said, different cells can behave differently for one thing, even though they have the same genotype. Um, but also um, that an individual with a given uh, genotype, some aspects of their phenotype will be de determined by their environment, um, the way they live their lives. As a, as a very simple example, um, if you're looking at um, someone with a disease, you might be interested to know whether they um, smoke or drink alcohol and those kinds of things, what kind of exercise regime they have, what their diet is like, and so on. So those things are equally important in terms of determining the outcomes that are given by the genotype. So a revolution has taken place in the last decade or so with our ability to measure DNA. Um, and so this high throughput DNA sequencing technology has come about. And you can see in this very simple diagram, you take a, a DNA sample, which is biological material. It might be taken from, say, a blood sample from a patient. Um, you do all this chemistry to it, and then you stick it in this machine that looks a bit like an oversized printer, um, and you wait for a bit, and then the machine spits out digital um, information that gives us genotype for the patient. Um, so a typical um, example for a human uh, genome, if you wanted to sequence the entire human genome, of about three billion nucleotides in human genome, you get about 70 gigabytes of data, roughly, depending on how you do the experiment on this machine. And you get files out 
that can be dealt with with a computer, and that's where um, the computing aspect comes in. And the stuff on the left-hand side of the diagram is done by more or less biologists, um, and that's not really the focus of my talk, and I don't really know actually what they do. Um, Rip, uh, Alan probably knows a fair bit about that, um, whereas that's all magic to me. Um, this is a, a graph that you'll see variations of today, I suspect, uh, multiple times. Um, the key point is that we've got cost on the vertical axis in log scale and time on the horizontal axis, and you can see that the cost of sequencing DNA um, through high put, uh, sequencing has dropped off rapidly um, faster than um, Moore's law, um, and so we've gotten down to the, the point where it's um, hovering around $1,000 or so, um, and what the, the key point of that is that uh, it's got to the stage that um, you can sequence the DNA of an individual um, at a cost that's fundable by um, health cover, right? So it's become within the realm of something that's feasible to do on a, per, on a, on a patient basis, a per patient basis. Before that, at the very beginning, it was um, uh, exorbitantly expensive. Um, but now it's something we can probably do routinely. You'll give me five minutes notice, yeah. Um, so what's happened is that um, we can measure genotypes in a cheap and accurate way now with this high throughput sequencing technology. Um, and also, um, because we can sequence lots of individuals, we can accumulate that data. And um, by accumulating more and more anonymized data about individuals, we learn more about the connection between genotype and phenotype. Remembering, of course, that environment is important as well. Um, but this means that um, there's a lot of uh, value in starting to do this in a medical setting rather than just research. And so that brings me to an initiative called the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance, which um, has been underway for a couple of years now. And it, uh, it's basically an attempt to uh, kickstart genomics in a medical setting in the state of Victoria and there are about 10 participating alliance members, which are mostly hospitals and research institutes. You can see their logos on that slide. So it's a lot of the major um, hospitals and research institutes getting together and saying, yes, the time is right. We should be considering doing this in a clinical setting, so let's get going and make it happen. And it's uh, one of the major funders is the Victorian state government. And so I work at VLSCI, but we um, partner with the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance um, to make this happen. So this is an example from um, the first phase from Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance. Um, we studied five different patient cohorts. You can think of a cohort as like a disease um, category, if you like. And um, one of the categories was childhood syndromes, which really captures a bunch of rare genetic um, medical conditions that affect children. Um, we had 80 patients in the study, um, and in this little table here, you can see that we compared the results from doing genomics on patient outcomes to the standard treatment that those patients would have had if we didn't do genomics instead. And so there were 80 patients. With genomics, we were able to get an accurate diagnosis in 47 cases, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in standard care, they were only getting 10. So that gives you an idea that when patients come to a hospital and doctors look at their phenotype, then it can be quite tricky to figure out what's actually going on. Furthermore, um, the cost per diagnosis dramatically reduced to about a quarter, um, which is also uh, significant um, in terms of actually making uh, or treating more and more patients. The cheaper it is, the better. Um, but hidden from this table of numbers is another important factor, which is under standard care, many of these patients would have had to undergo fairly significant um, operations to figure out what's going on, which are fairly traumatic operations, and hence the cost, um, but also pretty traumatic if you're a child having to go through those um, treatments. And so genomics um, is really much simpler. It really requires a, a blood sample, and that's it. Um, and so uh, I think that's one of the major advantages as well. Um, and this is, this is obviously, I'm cherry-picked a, a good example. Um, it doesn't always work out this well, but I think um, in, in time, 
we'll see even uh, uh, these kind of numbers across many more um, disease types. So there's lots of technical challenges, which um, while they are challenges, they're great for us um, working in the field because it gives us work to do. Um, one of the main problems is that the current DNA sequencing technology, even though it's cheap and accurate, it's a little bit annoying in that it generates, um, when it reads out the genotype, it gives you back millions of little fragments. Um, so the entire human genome is about three billion DNA nucleotides long. Um, these machines give you uh, um, segments of about 150 to 200 at a time. And they're scattered all over the genome. And so the output of the machine um, is this big file, 70 gigabytes if you did a whole genome but you've got to actually figure out where all of these little fragments came from, and that's computationally expensive and a, a challenge. Um, also, any two humans differ in about three million DNA bases, give or take, and that's very crude, because I haven't talked about all the kinds of differences that can be, um, but that's a, a good enough uh, figure to give you an idea that between any two of us in the room, there are lots of variation between our DNA sequences. Um, but most of that variation is what you'd say is benign. It, it doesn't really have any adverse effects. A lot of it we have no idea what the variation means, if anything at all. Um, and so um, that means we have to do various things to sort, um, sort out all these problems. So we have to actually piece all these DNA fragments back together. As I said, that's computationally challenging. Um, we also must filter the, these large number of variants that we find. Um, to figure out which ones are significant. So it's a bit of a needle in the haystack problem. Um, and especially from the point of view of clinical genomics, the entire process from sample collection to diagnosis must be robust because we're treating people in hospitals. And so um, that's uh, really important that we have um, uh, quality control. We want to make sure that the process is reliable, repeatable, um, and robust. So here's a, a very zoomed out bird's eye view of the analysis that we do. Um, over on the left hand side, we have all of the biological activity at the start, which is collecting samples of DNA from individuals. And um, down the bottom there, you've got different types of cohorts, which are relevant to the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance. Um, four are listed there. We actually did five um, in, the, in the first phase, which has just come to completion. And so missing from that is um, childhood syndromes. Um, so we, we sample the sequences, uh, sorry, we take uh, d biological samples from these uh, individuals. We put them in the DNA sequencing machine and out pops a file in digital form that we can then analyze. Um, and so here we've got C pipe in the middle, which I'll talk about in a moment. And basically this is a big computational process which takes all of those little fragments of DNA finds out where they belong in the original uh, genome, puts them back together, and then tries to determine from that re, um, reassembled DNA sequence um, where the variation is. How does this individual compare to everybody else? Um, and then it figures out what it thinks are the most significant and relevant um, variations for the point of view of the, the, the disease phenotype that we're looking at. And then it stores that information in a database called LoveD, but it also produces some outputs that are relevant for clinical um, investigation. So some, some um, QC reports, um, other summary things that clinicians like to look at. That information is then handed over to clinicians. Uh, they access the database, LoveD, and then they curate the variants. So they might look through the variants and, and add extra information that they have from their expert knowledge and then they can use that to decide what to do for the patient. So moving more from the biological point of view into the computing side, uh, there are two major um, software components um, that we uh, work with, which is LoveD, as I've mentioned, which is a database that collects the variants that come out of the um, analysis pipeline. And there's CPipe, which is a data flow system for um, orchestrating all of that. And so LoveD is the Leiden Open Variation Database. It's from Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. It's built primarily out of PHP and MySQL, and it's GPL um, licensed. Um, but we've added extensive modifications ourselves, and that's one of the beauties of open source software. You can extend as you, as you need. 
I don't need to sell that idea to you guys though, of course. And so the other part that we have is CPipe. Um, that was created and maintained um, by Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance. Uh, it's primarily built in Groovy, which is a scripting language built on top of Java, um, and also bits of Python and Bash. Um, like any good scientific um, code, it consists of lots of bits and pieces of things. Um, it's also GPL um, and open source. Uh, obviously, you can uh, see the code on GitHub. So CPipe is based on something called BPipe. Um, so the next one will be C++ pipe, presumably. <laughs> um, the, the cool thing about BPipe uh, is it gives us this nice syntax um, for writing down computational workflows. You don't have to understand the details of this slide, um, rather just absorb the syntax niceness. Um, and at the top we have a, a stage in the pipeline called a line reads, which takes these little fragments of DNA and works out where they might line up best against the reference DNA sequence. So we have a kind of um, pretend gold standard human reference um, that we can take these little reads and compare against. And that runs a command, um, and that runs a program called BWA, um, which takes some input and produces some output. Um, and then you can see down the bottom, there's the, in the entire pipeline, or at least a pretend one, um, run just says do this job. Um, but you can see it, the first thing it does is align reads, and then the plus means and then do something else, so it's a sequential operation. And then in brackets, it says do dedupe, which is remove duplicate reads, um, and calculate stats, um, which computes some summary information. In the brackets, that's done in parallel. So those two things um, don't, they don't depend on each other, so we can do them together. Uh, and then uh, after that, we can call variants. And so um, BPipe, which is really internal in CPipe, it arranges for this computational workflow to run on the computer cluster, and it makes sure that the dependencies are maintained in the correct order. It also makes sure that if things don't complete correctly, which they sometimes don't do, that if you ran it again, you wouldn't get inconsistent results. Here's a, a summary of the stages in the, the workflow. I don't, again, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, rather just to um, get the point across that this is a data flow problem. Um, it's a classic data flow problem. We start off with our sequencing data that comes out of the sequencing machine at the start, and we end up with basically spreadsheets at the end, which are then given off to clinicians, and a couple of other files along the way. Um, you can see there's, it's basically a sequential workflow. There are a couple of branches along the way, um, but there are many, many tools involved in getting this computation completed. And so this is a selection of, it's not all of the things we use, but a selection of the main tools that constitute that workflow. Um, again, you don't have to worry about the details except to say that um, if you look through there, I've put the licenses next to each of the bits of software, and by and large, the licenses are open source. Um, there's a few tricky ones in there, which I've put as academic license because they're licensed in ways that uh, sort of free for use for academic purposes, but then um, have other clauses which, uh, if, you, if you're not doing academic work. Um, yeah, so it just highlights the fact that um, each of these tools is, most of these are open source. And I was talking to someone the other day about this. One of the other virtues of open source software is it's really developed independently. So each of these tools is made by some other group in the world. And because they're not tightly coupled, they're re we're really forced to come up with data formats for communication between them to make our systems modular. So just so happens that by virtue of everything being developed independently, we end up with a fairly modular system of software that we can plug together in different ways. Um, and so that's a nice outcome. Also, um, Belinda will be speaking about R, which is one of the things mentioned there um, later on today. It's one of the programming languages used for statistical analysis. So here's a sort of computational infrastructure we use to, do, to run the CPipe workflow. We've got five cluster nodes dedicated to this work on a IBM iDataplex x86 cluster, 16 cores per node, so that's what um, 80 or so cores um, dedicated to this work. Uh, the most computationally expensive part is that alignment, which is taking the little reads and figuring out where they belong. We've got a lot of memory. Um, 
probably way more than we actually need, but that's a historical aspect. We've got one terabyte of RAM per node. Um, so it's lovely to have lots of RAM on your computer and never have to worry about running out of memory. Um, and so that's nice. We run Red Hat. The nodes are connected by InfiniBand um, and it's all hooked up to a high performance file system which is supplied by IBM. It's the GPFS file system and it has hierarchical storage management. So that means that files that are uh, not used recently get migrated off the tape in a seamless way. Um, so that means that the actual spinning disk um, is used for um, data that's being worked on um, recently. So it keeps the performance of the file system good. And we use Slurm um, for um, uh, running jobs on the cluster as well. And actually, all of that's managed by VLSI in, in the same way that we manage the rest of our systems. And so that's a nice feature of um, uh, using the same system as we get the administration more or less um, within the rest of VLSI. We also use a whole bunch of other things uh, in our work um, for computational infrastructure. We use the Nectar cloud for um, running the LoveD database. Nectar is a research cloud that's um, operated in Australia um, and available for researchers um, throughout the country. Um, we also use Vicnode, which is related in some ways um, for storage and backup. And Vicnode is sort of like Nectar, but um, they provide um, data storage, whereas Nectar provide compute, but you can connect them together. Um, and we uh, use Jira and Confluence, which I realize are not open source, but just giving you an idea um, of project management tools that we use, and Git and GitHub. Um, and so really the point of my talk is actually um, the computational perspective of clinical genomics is if you're in the area of open source software and Linux, computing in general, software engineering, you already know a lot about what we do. A lot of what we do is what you do as well, um, except we're applying it to this problem of clinical genomics, DNA sequencing. So if you have skills in that area, you are in demand, people need these skills, um, and it's a good area to work in. Uh, it's, very, has, it's very high on job satisfaction because you can sometimes get really excellent reports back um, from your work affecting people's lives. So that's rather nice. Um, also, open source software systems and software engineering have a big impact in diagnosis and treatment. So we do good work in our job. It translates to um, better results in the hospital. Uh, and that, I think, is a really nice story. And it's not something I had imagined I would ever do in my life when I was studying computing. Um, so it sort of revitalized my interest in keeping working in computing because it's, I can see that I can have an impact in the world. Um, also, um, Alan uh, said it was okay if I should mention this. Um, we're hiring at the moment, so if you think this might be something you're interested in, um, maybe get in touch with me. Um, we're looking for a couple of software developers. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to thank a few people who helped out with this talk. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, I'll just get the mic Wait, up to microphone. So if you go back to the page where you list all the software that you're using. Yes. There we go. So there you have, say you have a custom version of SQLite. Yep. So, so what do you have that's custom in it? Oh, no, that's just because I was, that's not our custom. Um, that's just the SQL li license. Um, it didn't fit exactly into any of these categories, so I just stuck it under a, a sort of generic term. Yeah. Yep, way out in the back. Actually, while well, the microphone's going, could you just transfer over there? Um, I'll just say that um, this is something where in bioinformatics we fall down a little bit in terms of actually being good with licensing our software. Um, and in particular, I had to search quite hard in some cases to find out what the licenses were for some of these tools because they don't make it apparent. Um, and we could do better, uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, could you explain how long things take for the sequencing and also how long the software takes to, to run? Yeah, so sequencing time varies. 
depending on what kind of experiment you're doing. And, and the, those sequencing machines are very flexible. You can do a lot of different kinds of experiments on those machines. You can multiplex many samples together if you want to by only sequencing parts of them. Um, but you're looking at hours to a day sort of turnaround time, more or less. Um, having said that, I'm not normally in those those uh, the room where they do the sequencing. They, I just receive a file, um, and and it's also getting faster as well. Um, so that's good. Um, there's also even fancier technology on the on the horizon, which is able to produce even more sequences of DNA um, more cheaply. Um, Torsten may talk about that um, today. Am I right? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> he's looking a bit worried. Um, yeah. So in ter in terms of in terms of the the computation time. Um, the turnaround, well, again, it depends on the number of samples we do, and a sample basically corresponds to an individual. We might do um, 20 at a time, which is not very many, um, but the turnaround for that is, um, again, several hours. And it's important to keep the turnaround time down in clinical setting because we actually sometimes reanalyze data. So what can happen is that a new discovery is made in research, and you remember I showed you that table which said we had so many people diagnosed and there were quite a f about half of them weren't diagnosed. What can happen is that those missing diagnoses can actually be um, you know, improved upon with new information. And so occasionally when there's new discoveries, we rerun the entire analysis again. And, so, and sometimes there's urgency in doing that because some treatment might need to be done quickly. And so we need to do it in a matter of hours. Um, but what's going to happen, as you can imagine, once this gets really deployed across hospitals, we're going to want to do thousands or more of these. And so the computational infrastructure has to grow substantially. Yeah. So who's responsible for installing all of these tools and what is the process to get them updated to a new version if, if that's a requirement? Yeah, so um, most of these tools are packaged with CPipe and um, because of um, accreditation requirements, so we actually need to pin down everything as much as we can because we, we want to make sure that every time we run this, we get the same results within reason. Um, and um, so this is all packaged and pinned down to versions um, explicitly. If any update is made because this pipeline is accredited by NATA, um, we have to go through the accreditation process. And so it's a costly thing to do, and so you don't want to be doing that very often. Uh, and so um, who installs them? At the moment, we basically manage it ourselves. Um, we're in the future hoping to um, sort of um, containerize this stuff a little bit so that it's a bit more self-contained and you could really run it on the cloud if you wanted to. And that's something we're working towards. Uh, please join me in thanking Bernie again for a great talk.